Ah, we're on. <laughs> hey, welcome to the program. You know, technology is what it is. I guess we have some uh, cash. Our, our catch is that we call cash? Cash? It's not called cash. It's cash you spend. Cash you, you hope you have enough of, so you don't have these technology problems. Anyway, hi everyone. It's Emil. It's Emil Guillermo. Emil Amuck to you. This is my takeout. Emil Amuck's takeout. My takes on all things considerable. Man, what a weekend, huh? I slowly, I'm, I'm coming out of my closet uh, to to be with people, family, friends that I haven't seen in years, and so maybe it'll be you one day. I mean, I. Really, I, I saw some people this weekend I haven't seen in three years, which shows how paranoid I was. Not paranoid. Shows how careful I was from the pandemic. Really. I mean, it was. I mean, that's what it was. It was. I was careful. And I, I listened to. I, I listened to the experts who I trusted, I listened to science, right? I wore a mask. I mean, I certainly didn't listen to to Trump's experts because, you know, Trump, Trump, Trump's experts, like Scott Atlas, who amazingly was on the, the graduation speaking circuit. I mean, what would you want to hear from a guy like Scott Atlas? who went, who really was the ideologue with the, with the doctor certification, right? I mean, he's, he was a doctor and, and, and a pretty respected doctor, a radiologist, but respected. What does he know about COVID? Nothing, but he's a doctor. So it's like, you know, a, a TV doctor going on defending Trump saying, oh, mask, you don't need masks. I mean, I think that was the thing that upset a lot of people that he was passing on misinformation. And because of misinformation, like saying that masks did not have any impact, probably cost some people their lives. I mean, we know that masks aren't the be all end all, but we know the masks do help. The masks provide a a barrier you know it gives you time it's 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 not going to as i said be the be all end all in terms of you know the virus fighting the virus but it is an important tool and there was scott atlas during his tenure as trump's advisor saying masks don't work and a lot of people said oh yeah we believe you and then we have over a million dead misinformation i mean there was another story today breaking about misinformation that was kind of surprising because it was put out by people with a blue check on twitter and people said oh well just because you have a blue check doesn't mean anything well just because you're with the white house doesn't mean anything either as we've learned this is the problem with news and information in this this age that we're in where chat gpt can replicate things and voices and images and people with reputable reputable backgrounds can put things out and then if they're not quick to correct we're screwed so i i do this show as a news talk program i don't pretend to be your only silo i say come and see what an asian american thinks W-D-A-A-A-T. If that's your question, what does an Asian American think? Come to the show. I'm the only monk's takeout. So anyway, I, this weekend, I, I did see a number of people I hadn't seen. And I'm talking not just about casual acquaintances. I'm talking about relatives. I'm talking about my, si- I hadn't seen my sister in person for about three years. I mean, I've seen her on online, of course on Zoom meetings and that kind of family Zoom meetings. But in person, I hadn't seen her. My nieces, her husband, 
Um, and I have to admit, I mean, there's something about if you know that it's going to be a a uh, you know a reunion of sorts, you prepare and you're ready to forgive. I mean, I'm not saying that we had any huge argument or anything, but you know, either before the pandemic or during the pandemic, but if there were, if there were any kind of small well, if there were any kind of disagreement, period, it was small compared to the very big thing about, oh, my God, here, here we are together in person. I saw cousins. I saw first cousins. Uh, it was it was a, a great family event, and it was a birthday party for a one-year-old uh, nephew. And... It's nice that we can have this, but I'll tell you something. I'm still a little nervous that, well, you hope people are responsible. You hope people would test if they were, if they might have been exposed, if they, but I don't know if they, they, they think that. You're still on your guard. You still carry a mask and are ready to wear it when you need to. But this is just the new post pandemic period. So I'm saying, if I see you and for the first time in three years and I'm not wearing a mask, maybe I trust you a little more. Or maybe it's a, a situation where uh, there's eating and drinking and, you know, you don't want to like, you still wear a mask. I, I still wear a mask in restaurants. And I take it off as I consume and imbibe and what whatnot. But we're in an era of caution. I mean, I think that's the thing. We're just still it's not over even though what i was reading in the uh the paper today that where is that doctors and doctors hospitals ending mass mandates clinics across the u.s some of the last bastions requiring mask and covid 19 mass or covid 19 tests are ending the mandates happening in Boston, parts in California. Actually, I saw some signs at supermarkets yesterday that had, you know, the courtesy of, you know, please be responsible and think of your, your fellow, fellow store, uh, store visitors. I went to a store and I, there were some people wearing masks. People are still being responsible. And you know, if you're going to go into an Asian community thing, you're going to see people masked. Because that's our thing. We're masked Asians. Anyway, so it was a, it was a good time. I hope you had a good weekend. Um, it was good, good basketball weekend. The Lakers are playing the... Uh, they're playing the Nuggets. The Lakers are down three zip. That's great. I, I, I don't want them to win. I'd rather see the Nuggets win. Denver Nuggets. Uh, we had Boston annihilated yesterday by the Miami Heat, which is good because that's uh, Eric Spolstra, half Filipino. So I'm rooting off for all the Filipino uh, sports types. Spolstra with the Heat coach, half Filipino. Uh, Jason Robertson, Dallas Stars lost again in overtime yesterday. I'm rooting for he's half Filipino. All the NHL, there are a lot of NHL stars. In, uh, in hockey, it turns out, those uh, Asian-American or Filipino-American and Filipino-Canadian up there. So uh, so it's been a good sports time. Uh, if you're watching last night, Ian, Iam, I-A-M, that's not a mistake, Iam, I am Tongi, Iam Tongi, the young, young man who put the NHPI in A-A-N-H-P-I, Born, first Hawaiian-born Pacific Islander to sing and win ABC's Vocal Talent Contest American Idol last night. If you saw it, wow, what, what a performance, you know? I mean, he's been a, a favorite all throughout, it seems. It's like he couldn't, the judges seemed like they were in love with him. And I wrote a piece for the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund their site because not only was American Idol this weekend 
where E.M. Tongi wins, but there's also the announcement by Harvard of the actual Asian, the actual stats of the Asian American in admissions into Harvard. The matriculates, those who matriculate, have said that they're going to come in. And I have to admit that watching E.M. Tongi win Idol kind of made me think about Harvard, the Harvard admissions a little differently. And I'll, I'll go on and talk about that today. Also talk about Bill Gates. Oh, man. You know this is a big story because it kind of kind of bled into the weekend. But, and I saw it on Twitter and I wasn't sure about the sources, but when I see it in the Wall Street Journal, you know, well, the Wall Street Journal, it's, look, it's a Murdoch paper, but it's credible enough. And when they sneak the Epstein story, the headline at the top of the fold, you know, for a Monday, they, they, they think it's important. Not, not they don't want to overwhelm you with its importance, but it does say so, something about one of the richest men in the world, Bill Gates, my classmate. And so I'll, I'll read from this. If you don't know about it, the Epstein Gates connection, according to some sources, more real than not, he may not have gone to the, to the Island as he's denied, but something was going on, and we'll get into that in a sec. But back to E.M. Tongi, 18-year-old from Kahuku, North Shore of Oahu, right there near Turtle Bay. Top boat getter, 21st year of the show. And I've been watching the show all 21 years, you know, since my kids were young. And there's something about voting for Idol that it makes you feel like, oh, this is democracy in action. You know, I mean, I wish democracy was as easy as voting for American Idol. You should like to vote. And see, in American Idol, they let you vote more than once, but only maximum of 10 times. So I got to vote for E.M. Tongi. He beat out the country singer, Megan Danielle. She's going to be big, too. Tongi's 18... Megan Danielle is 19. She's from Georgia. And I think the thing about Tongi is that he reminds people, and no one would say this because it would seem so obvious, so cliche, maybe. But Tongi was so reminiscent of that other Hawaiian singer, is, right? Is Israel Kamaka, Kamaka We Ole, aka Brita is. So, Britta Is, who died in 1997, of course, was known around the world for his ukulele version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And, thank goodness, I mean, you don't want to put that kind of burden on someone like Tongi, but here he is, he won. He gets adulation and praise from all the judges. So, if you were thinking it, I'm saying it. You know, no matter how good his closest rival, Megan Danielle, was with her gritty Southern lilt and her, her voice reminiscent of a young Dolly Parton, you know that wasn't going to stop the second coming of Brother Is. So, some good memories when E.M. Tongi took the stage because, you know, if you've been watching the show for a long time, 2004, Hawaii's Filipino-American Jasmine Trias finished in the top three. Didn't win. Nepalese-American Arthur Gunn finished second in 2020. Asian-Americans have come close to capturing the title, but Tongi broke through this year. He, You knew from the start with his emotional renditions of songs like uh, James Blunt's Monsters, very touching, emotional song. That was early on in the competition. On Sunday, he did the song again. But this time, he was paired with James Blunt himself. A live performance dedicated to Tongi's late father. And 
You know they'd had to leave Tongi and the audience in tears. There was Tongi was breaking up. Blunt was almost. See, he was. You could see him trying to console Tongi. Emotionally, the judges were crying. When that happened, about an hour and a half into the show, you just knew there was no way Tongi was going to lose tonight. You know, with the live voting, and because I'm on the West Coast, I was watching the show at like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a primetime show in the East, but it's on at 5 here and, and back in Hawaii, where Tongi, that's his home base. People were watching in the afternoon. Sunny day in Hawaii, let's go watch him. Let's vote for him on Idol. So, he's ready to make a splash with this stamp of of approval from American Idol. Uh, Last week, Tongi was in Oahu for that traditional home visit segment of the finalists, and thousands of people went up to Turtle Bay, which is, you know, it's one of my favorite spots in, uh, on Oahu, because, you know, I just love Oahu. I I like, of course I like Waikiki, but there are other parts of Waikiki, uh, other parts of Oahu that you can go to mostly North shore, right? You go up to turtle Bay or you go down a little further to the uh, East and go to Lonnie Kai or go to, you know, there's so many things. I mean, it's a perfect mix between the city urban feel of Honolulu and, and the wild, right? North shore. As you you know go up why not hit up so I look I I, I I loved my time in Hawaii and uh, so I was I liked that segment where Tongi went back and he was given an honorary high school diploma from Kahuku High which I point out in my column today in the uh, Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund nice touch nice gesture but after winning American Idol Tongi doesn't need, even need a, a diploma from Harvard. Others do, though. And that's the second part of my column where I talk about last Friday's announcement that Harvard has issued an, a record number of Asian Americans. And, of course, I mention this because the one thing that a lot of people are following higher ed are doing, they're waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on a lawsuit that Asian Americans conservative Asian Americans against affirmative action have filed against Harvard to try to to claim discrimination and take down affirmative action at Harvard. And so Harvard actually released the numbers that this year, 56,937 people applied to Harvard, but only 1,942 got in. If you do the math, that's a 3.41% percent acceptance rate which is tighter than it was when i was trying to get in harvard i mean imagine 3.41 acceptance rate i mean that's i mean it was like nine or ten percent when i was in it's three times tighter so much harder now but i think it's much harder because the spaces available 2,000 a year, roughly, remain the same. But the number of people applying to Harvard just explode, exploded over the last 5, 10 years. Now, 56,937, 57,000, essentially. So, on Friday, the college announced 84% said they would matriculate or actually enroll this fall. 84, and that's high. That's like 630 students. And about... 486 of them are Asian American, which makes for a freshman class that's 29.8% Asian, 2% higher than the record set last year. This is a record number of Asians. And I I don't include the the native Hawaiians because they're in another category, but 29.8% Asian, you think about what the Supreme Court is about to do when they are expected to opine on this lawsuit that claims that Harvard 
and its process of admissions discriminates against Asians. And you think about that and what has happened in the, I think it's like four years or so, seven years. I mean, it's been a long time that this, this case has moved up through the courts and now at the Supreme Court's, uh, you know, lap. But as this case has moved along, the school has produced a class that is more Asian and more diverse in terms of race and class in its history. I mean, that's pretty good. Now, the black student population is down slightly, but still at 14.1% of the new class. The Latinx students down from 11.9% to 11.1%. So it's not perfect. Native Americans and Native Hawaiians were at 3.6% last year. Now they're at 2.3%. Not perfect, right? But, and white students are up 42.5% to 42.7%. About the same. Still too close to 50% for my days. And while it doesn't exactly look like America with Asians at 29.8% of the class, that's more than four times the Asian population in the U.S., by the way. That's a kind of overrepresentation. But I have to say the school has a racial diversity that wasn't present when I was a student there in the 70s. That is something to be lauded by Harvard. And something that should be recognized by the court as maybe, I mean, I, I you know, the court's not going to, I'm pretty sure, not going to take any of this into consideration. They might, they should. Because as I said, what is the Supreme Court trying to do? Remedy the discrimination toward, that might be, may or may not be true against these Asian Americans? They're the ones who filed the suit. When the school is so diverse racially and so diverse economically. I mean, Harvard also this last year raised the threshold for its zero cost program, meaning if you're a family making 75,000 a year, well, they, they said, okay, if you're a family making less than 85,000, a year, you can qualify for this zero cost program which means that nearly 24% of the incoming class are from families that qualify, which means that it's not all uniformly wealthy people there at Harvard, but there's a, there's a kind of stratified Harvard. If 24% of the incoming class, this freshman class are from families that, that make less than 85,000 a year. Now, this doesn't exactly make Harvard a public school, but as I said, the school has a much better mix of class and race than before. It's not that kind of elitist place as it was in the old days, but let's, let's be honest. The fourth generation legacy still gets in. So do the wealthy. That's the affirmative action that needs to be excised not the things that are done to remedy differences in class and race, but there's this hidden affirmative action, and that's what the Supreme Court doesn't really address. So, you know, it makes one wonder, well, what is exactly the court trying to do when they rule on this discrimination claim by Asian Americans? who I feel have been duped by anti-affirmative action types, but most feel that the Supreme Court could ban affirmative action and force every college, not just Harvard, into some form of race-blind admissions. Because that's a remedy for the Asian Americans who felt discriminated. But how would a race-blind policy improve what Harvard was able to accomplish on its own using race as just one factor among many? I mean, you might make things worse. I mean, if they went to a race-blind admissions policy at Harvard, what if 
such a change means the school's Asian population jumps up from like 20, not essentially 29% to 40% Asian, like some UC University of California campuses. Of course, the number could go down too. If you're race blind. And what about representation of other groups like black and Latinx admissions? They they actually suffered a slight decrease this last year. Well, will they decline even further? And why did admissions go back over 50% if they if the Supreme Court says, hey, we're moving toward colorblind, race blind admissions? Well, that would be totally satisfactory to the Republican Party because their goal is that diversity is not considered a dirty word by anti-woke Republicans. Now, the Supreme Court could always just say, yeah, you know, we have this case and we were telling you that we're going to come out with a ruling, but, you know, maybe the lower court's ruling that sided with Harvard, maybe they got it right. Maybe that's the Supreme Court could do that. I mean, that wouldn't be a bad way to go for them. But the, the Supreme seem ready to undo the kind of progress that appears to be being made with just a standard admissions pro- process. I mean, no real discrimination against Asians. Were there 29.8%? Nearly 30%? So what I'm thinking, and this is my change in my opinion about Harvard and their admissions process, maybe they should consider totally blind. What I would consider uh, an enlightened lottery. You can make it a lottery. You could make sure that whoever can enter the lottery is qualified on the basis of test scores or the basis of whatever factor, right? You can maybe have the same process that you have now say, oh, these people are qualified. And then you put them all in a kind of pool. You know, maybe every, give everyone a ping pong ball number. And then let, let a machine pull out the numbers and give it out to the spaces, the 2,000 spaces that are available each year. This would be fair and take out the affirmative action for the W&W, the white and wealthy. What it would also do, it would acknowledge that in life, there's more to success than merit. There is the idea of pure luck. Now, I have been previously negative toward any kind of lottery-based admissions. Because I thought I, I, I said I stated publicly that a lottery, when you have real data, why would you leave it up to chance? But it may be the only way to make things fair. I mean, when you're dealing with limited resources doled out in terms of admission spaces in a school like Harvard, well, how else do you make things fair? Here's the thing, you know, talent wins out most times in life when it comes to success. Like an E.M. Tongi, an idol, that that was merit. But when it's so close and Tongi has to beat out the country western singer, the young girl from Georgia, I mean, then it becomes subjective, then it becomes a matter of luck. Luck is needed to succeed in life. So maybe this is the aspect of this process that I just didn't want to see as the option, but maybe it's time to go that way. Let's see how lucky you are on your college choice. Besides, we know how much AAPIs, Asians love to gamble, right? I mean, just coming to America, was a gamble. So if 
If you catch my, my post and you know someone or maybe you are one of the 486 Asian Americans planning to enroll in the fall at Harvard, congratulations. But if you're not matriculating there, perhaps because you were rejected, I hope you're not planning to sue because you weren't discriminated against. Think of it this way. Of the 1,942 who were originally admitted, 312 people among them actually said no to Harvard. Or maybe Harvard was their backup and they're going to go to their first choice. I don't know. They didn't say what their first choice was. Or they didn't, Harvard didn't release that in their press release. But if you got rejected and you may want to see where those 312 nays- naysayers are going and join you know, you would just, you they just want to join them and say, I'm a member of the just say no to Harvard club. You're a natural, you know, no, but just don't sue. Because as I like to say, one time wasting lawsuit, like the one that took years, it was forged by conservative zealots and fronted by Asian Americans is one too many. Now, I don't even hope they win because I know, well, I don't know what, I, but my sense is they're going to win. I wish it wasn't the case, but with a 6 record, it looks like they might. But there's ways out of it if it wasn't so damn political. One of them is just understanding that really the Asian Americans had no case. The Asian Americans who claimed discrimination had no case. But here it is. Where we, everyone who's looking at higher ed is waiting for this case to come down with a decision made. And you know, if, if the affirmative action if the anti affirmative action people lose, they'll just come back and do another one. This is their life. This is their this is their professional calling. But like I said, I call it a time wasting lawsuit where conservative zealots use Asian Americans. One of those cases in a lifetime is one too many. All right, so that's uh the Harvard my my change, my slight change on the Harvard story. And that is really that maybe we ought to go to a lottery because there's a way to make the lottery. So it's still everyone in the pool is a qualified person, but then your pick is a matter of luck. And I think that's sort of the, the key. As long as everyone who is open to the lottery or admitted into the lottery is qualified, then it should it should satisfy satisfy everyone. Because there are no unqualified people. There. Everyone has qualified on the basis of whatever is deemed to make you qualified now. It's just the final choice of who gets in is dependent on what ping pong ball you get when your name is called. Just like any other lotto game. Ping pong goes up, oh, five, 33, and there's 2,000 spaces. Every space has a ping pong ball. And You, or every applicant, in this case, there would be like 60,000 ping pong balls. Get every, or maybe you could do it without ping pong balls. Less physical, but more digital, random. Get selected. That might be the fairest way. All right. So the other story, coincidentally, is about Harvard, too. It's not really about Harvard, but it's Harvard connected. Uh, 
I started seeing this in the news Friday, Saturday. Then the Wall Street Journal snuck it in top of the fold. So you know it's important. Epstein seemed to threaten Microsoft's gates over a fair. This is a tricky headline. It's not necessarily definitive. You could take it apart if you're pro gates. You could say, well, Epstein seemed to threaten Microsoft's gates over a fair. That sounds really solid. Seemed. Is he a seamstress? Okay, this is written by. by um, could, wow I, I thought it was a Kad Kadeka Kadeka Sadar I have my glasses on I still can't the print is so small Kadeka Sadar and Emily, oh, Emily I know Emily I mean I, I don't know Emily the writer but I know the name Emily Glazer. All right, here, here's the lead. Jeffrey Epstein discovered that Bill Gates had an affair with a Russian bridge player. Better bridge player than bridge builder, you know, because, you know, bridge builder, maybe extra muscular, bridge builder, bridge player, more intellectual prowess. All right, Jeffrey Epstein discovered that Bill Gates had an affair with a Russian bridge player and later appeared to use his knowledge to threaten one of the world's richest men, according to people familiar with the matter. Oh, always put the source, the attribution at the end, and who who are these people? People familiar with the matter. So now if you are the kind of stickler for, well, let's see if it's news, Epstein seemed to threaten Microsoft's gates. That's not very solid. So you might think you might, you might've like left right there, but if you see that, Oh, it was sourced by people who wanted to talk to somebody, but weren't, they weren't brave enough or courageous enough to give their own names. At that point, if you had a hundred readers, maybe you might've lost 50, maybe, I mean, sticklers or give me a source or I don't read it. So, I, I don't, I mean, this is the problem with this story. But I think more people read on because it's Gates, because it's Epstein, and because maybe Gates did something stupid besides try to monopolize the Microsoft uh, Internet browser market early on in his career. The Microsoft co-founder met the woman around, two, around 2010 when she was in her 20s. Hmm, 2010. That's, uh, he was 13 years younger. That means Gates was like in his uh, mid-50s. She was in her 20s. If we're to believe the source. Epstein met her in 2013 and later paid for her to attend software, software coding school. There are a lot of software coding schools. How much is software coding school? Well, in 2017, Epstein emailed Gates and asked to be reimbursed for the cost of the course, according to people familiar with the matter. Now, see, now there's that people, P-F-W-T-M, people familiar with the, the matter, P-F-W-T-M. There's that source again. That's the second graph. Now, if you're still in there, you're in there for the period interest. But if you're gone, you're saying, I don't have time to waste on this BS. Why are we learning about Epstein now? He's dead. Gates is, Gates is divorced. His wife has left him. He's paid the price. Why, why do we want to know about Gates's dalliance with a bridge? Because we do. We, we just do, right? The email came after the convicted sex offender had struggled and failed to persuade Gates to participate in a multi-billion dollar charitable fund 
that Epstein tried to establish with J.P. Morgan Chase. Hmm, the plot thickens. The implication behind the message, according to people who have viewed it, okay, so they're not just making up, they tell the reporter, the reporters here at the Wall Street Journal, that we've seen the note. So the implication was that Epstein could reveal the affair if Gates didn't keep up an association between the two men. Ah, kind of like a blackmail, like, oh, you know, you will keep talking to me, right? Because you wouldn't want me to go tell someone about this Russian bridge player, Bill. First quote, Mr. Gates met with Epstein solely for philanthropic purposes, having failed repeatedly to draw Mr. Gates beyond these matters. Epstein tried unsuccessfully to leverage a past relationship to threaten Mr. Gates, said a spokeswoman for Gates. Oh, now, now this is a hint. A spokeswoman for Gates. So now you got to wonder if people familiar with the matter, the FWTM, aren't people close to Gates? If the first person out quoted is a spokeswoman to Gates. Wow, is this how you play journalism? Well, it is. I mean, because let's face it, news is what people don't want you to know. And clearly, well, Epstein's dead. So he doesn't have a say. Gates doesn't want you to think that he's some kind of philanderer, although he was, but possibly he could be a philanderer if there was good reason for him to. And apparently, look, I had a philanderer, -er -er. I had to be one because he, he was gonna like tell on me. So, I mean, he was trying to cover up the the dalliance, which may seems like it was extended. Because and that's why he had to be with the Epstein. So if you were disappointed by Gates's choice of friends, not the Russian bridge player, but but uh, Jeffrey Epstein. This is a case of the devil made me do it, right? The, the devil made Bill Gates do it. So then uh, they, the Wall Street Journal story goes into the background. Epstein was accused in 2006 of sexually abusing girls as young as 14 and pleaded guilty in 2008 to soliciting and procuring a minor for prostitution. He spent time in a Florida jail and, and registered as a sex offender after the Miami Herald reported on dozens more women who said they were abused, he was arrested in 2009 on sex trafficking charges. He died later that year in jail while awaiting trial and what the medical examiner ruled was a suicide. Now that is pretty suspicious, but no one's investigating. Maybe some people want, who knows? We're speculating here now. But this is all in one, two, three, four, five graphs. Still with the store. I mean, at some point you say, I, I got enough. I just need to know who the source was. People familiar with the man. And then first quote was from a spokesperson for Gates, which makes you think, oh, maybe people familiar with the matter are pro Gates people. Gates, 67 years old and a classmate of Emil Guillermo. Oh, calls him a tech this is why I like newspapers, because you got to go to the jump. See, you can't do this with uh, online. You got, you know, online just scroll, 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 scroll. But here you got you got to, like, go to the jump. He's known as a technology advisor to Microsoft, and one of the largest shareholders has said he met Epstein a few times only to discuss philanthropy, which he regrets and calls a mistake. Now, finally, we get to the name of the bridge player, 
Myla Antonova, the Russian bridge player, declined to comment on Gates and said she didn't know who Epstein was when they met. I had no idea that he was a criminal or had any ulterior motive, she said of Epstein. I just thought he was a successful businessman and wanted to help, she added. I am disgusted with Epstein and what he did. Now, anyone who talks about Epstein must say that. You, you must throw in the Epstein disclosure. Of course, I'll talk to you about well, all I did with Epstein, but for I, what he did was disgusting. What a disgusting, deplorable man. Okay, now what do you want to know? That's how you talk about Jeffrey Epstein. If you want to talk to the mainstream press. The new details about Epstein and Gates reveal a layer of complexity to their relationship and shed new light on how Epstein operated. Yes. He had all these friends in high places, which is why he never called Emil Guillermo. In the years between his 2008 conviction and death, Epstein packed his days meeting with politicians, businessmen, academics, celebrities, even did a favor for to Noam Chomsky, the left-wing guy, left-wing uh, academic, the uh, the linguist he is, I believe. I mean, he's the leading authority of left-wing politics. And he was caught in Epstein's snare. I don't know if it's because he liked he liked them young. I know he liked them left. He liked them left leaning, but did did Chomsky like them young? The Wall Street Journal article says Epstein provided favors and sought to use the connections for his own purposes. And when the relationship soured, he could turn against people. Which is you know why he's a dirty guy. Gates with a net worth in excess of one hundred billion, in case you're counting. And one of the world's biggest philanthropists was among the most well-known names in Epstein's calendar. Starting in 2011, Gates had more than a half dozen meetings scheduled with Epstein, including dinners at Epstein's New York townhouse. Documents show Gates flew on Epstein's private plane from New Jersey to Florida in March 2013, according to flight records. That same month, the two men met in France with an official on the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. They spent much of the day together, or much of a day together in New York City in September 2014, meeting other billionaires, the journal reported. Gates has said he learned to play bridge from his parents and the card game became one of his favorite hobbies. Gates played with Antonova, another devotee of the game. She attended a university in Russia between 2000 and 2005 according to her LinkedIn profile. She later founded a bridge club in the U.S. before taking on several roles as a software engineer in the Bay Area, her LinkedIn profile shows. And so uh, the article goes on. It's several more inches long, and she wanted to raise a couple hundred thousand, 500,000 to do uh, a bridge teaching thing online, and that's why she was meeting with with Epstein, but here's the story. I mean, look, we we're not even a quarter of the story into one jump in. It's top of the fold, and the only reason I think the Wall Street Journal puts it at the top of the fold as the big story, as one of the top stories, right? Top of the fold, big story, is because it embarrasses Bill Gates, and yet Bill Gates looks like he might have been a participant in the story as one of those close to close to uh, the matter. Gates are, you know, a lieutenant or a lieutenant just because he wants to make sure that there's no speculation, that people know the truth. But he does, doesn't want it pinned to him. So that's how the elites talk to each other on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Kind of ridiculous, huh? I mean, it's just the way it is. But, you know... Uh, some people will read that and then come away thinking different things like, oh, Gates is a bad guy. Well, he might be. But... Anyway, I... we're not done with the Jeffrey Epstein story because it's going to destroy some people who are alive. 
And, you know, what difference does it make to Gates? I mean, he's got all the money. He doesn't need the money. He could do what most people do when they've done their thing. He can withdraw. He can go off to a beach somewhere and play bridge with uh, local natives. Enjoy life. I don't know. I think... I don't know what happened to his marriage. But... You know, I, I make fun of him because he is the richest... Or one of the richest men in the world. But... I do have some empathy for him. Because... He's living proof that you can have all the money or you can have as much money as, say, a top tenor, not a one percenter, a top tenor, top ten, He's easily in top five, I think. And you're not happy. You, you're not happy. And you can't buy it. One thing he did do, though, that everyone reminds him, he dropped out of Harvard. And he lived without Harvard, which shows that all those people suing Harvard for discrimination, listen to Bill Gates, at least on that. Don't listen to him when it comes to Russian bridge players. But I'm dropping out of Harvard. All right, one one more thing I want to mention. Oh, the NAACP. You see, I was talking about going to the Keys, going to Florida. Despite the fact that Ron DeSantis may run for president, should, should announce sometime this week, Tim Scott, senator from South Carolina, announced today. I think they're going to need some people because when Donald Trump can't make it to a campaign because he's got to go to a court appearance or get indicted or something, I think we're going to need other candidates because we're going to come to the conclusion that, you know, we really should have a president who is unencumbered, unencumbered by the legal system. You know, don't you think, I, I think that would be, that would be ideal. That would be ideal. So, uh, anyway, the NAACP has issued a travel advisory for Florida over the weekend to warn potential tours of state laws and policies that the group sees as hostile to LGBTQ people or LGBT people. Wall Street Journal doesn't use the Q. LGBT people and people of color. Tourists should understand that, quote, Florida is openly hostile toward African Americans, people of color, and LGBTQ plus individuals, said the NAACP, a longstanding advocacy group for black Americans. Well, that's a strange way to identify the leading civil rights organization in the land. Other groups have issued similar advisories. I don't know the way that DeSantis is going on a rampage against woke and against history and critical race theory that isn't even being taught or against, you know, African American history, any kind of real U.S. history. I don't like it. I don't I don't like what Ron DeSantis is doing. I think you've got to get him where it hurts, and that is do what Disney has done. They're, Disney's pulled out their their billion dollar project. We gotta pull out our dollars from Florida too. All right. Uh coming up this Sunday, May twenty eighth, from two PM to five PM. I'm going to be joining five other professional Asian American storytellers in a uh, program called Strong Like Bamboo, co-hosted by Ethnotech and the Oakland Asian Cultural Center. 
We'll tell stories about discrimination and the outcomes that can strengthen our own ability to not only survive but thrive in this continuing era of anti-Asian hate. There's going to be a panel by Russell Jung, or facilitated by uh, Russell, PhD, Professor of Ethnic Studies, San Francisco State, and co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate. Participants are going to go in small groups if you participate live, if you're there at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center. And also, because it's going to be in person, but it's also going to be online on Zoom. So there'll be breakout rooms. There'll be two short films that will be shared and some music by Robert Kikuchi Ngoho and the senior women's rap group, The Folly. So it's it's a full 2 to 5 p.m. It's free. You can register to, att- to attend this free live in-person event at eventbrite.com. And uh, Strong Like Bamboo. Go to eventbrite, E-V-E-N-T-B-R-I-T-E dot com. And there'll be a recording made available for those who can attend. Or you can also join on Zoom if you want to participate. And there's a, a little URL. Go to the ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. And it's all listed there and all the links are there. It's a program that is funded by the California Arts Council and others. So definitely check it out. Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific. And you can watch it live at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center, 388 9th Street, Oakland, California. Second floor, 388 9th Street. Or, like I said, you can watch it on Zoom. You have to register for the event. It's free, but you got to register. Uh, go to Eventbrite, E V E N T B R I T E. Or go to my. Uh, my blog page on the ALDEF site, aaldef.org slash blog, and then go to uh, my uh, my latest column, and then scroll all the way down, and you'll see all the links there. All right. Hey, uh, Monday. What a Monday. Busy Monday. A lot of things happening. Uh, and like I said, I, I feel very grateful that I'm beginning to start beginning to see old friends I haven't seen in literally years. And I hope that you're one of those people that I see again. It's weird, you know, because for a lot of them, it's like, yeah, I haven't seen you in three years, but you're still the same or I'm still the same. It's just strange. It's just strange. But I think this will be the beginning of a summer where there's going to be a number of these. Oh my God, I haven't seen these people in three years. Anyway, uh, we're here Monday through Friday. You can always catch me here. I asked them, I say, do you see that thing I do on Facebook or the thing I do on YouTube? They say, oh yeah, yeah, we see that. Yeah, I mean, I just talk. There's no punchlines. I mean, I, there's there might be a punchline or two that I throw out there, but it's generally me talking. They say, oh yeah, yeah. We're here, we're here Monday through Friday, uh, around 2 p.m. Pacific. We talked for about an hour, just about news. It, it's It really is traditional news talk. Where I bring up a story, I give you my opinion. And what makes it better than news talk is I don't hear your, your voices. It's just me talking. Of course, if you're on Facebook, you can put on the chat. Give me your opinion. I'll go to that. Or send me an email. Give me your email at amok.com or on Facebook, and I'll, I'll read it. I, if you've got something to say, I'll read it. So Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific, live, and then catch your recordings on amok.com. Hey, look, thanks for being here. Big week ahead. Lakers get eliminated tonight, we hope. And then it's Denver, hopefully against the Celt- Oh no, against the Heat. Because the Celtics are going to get eliminated tomorrow. The NBA Finals. Maybe time to watch baseball if your teams aren't in it. The Giants look like one of the worst teams. But, you know, they might make it. They're they're starting to look charming, the Giants. They've got some rookies they're bringing up who look good. And 
this is the secret. The secret is you have a bad team, but you have rookies who look good that make your team charming and lovable, which the Giants weren't at the beginning of the season, but maybe they can. Maybe they can be. All right. Regular listeners of the show know that I like to meditate. Meditation has been a help. It really has. And it begins with the metta or the loving kindness meditation where you offer first the love to others and then to yourself. That's the only way it makes sense. And so, as I wish for me, I wish for you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Emil Guillermo here. Till next time. Mahal Kitab.